Okay, welcome to the reading of Lord of the Flies. We are in chapter four, page 69 of your PDF. Pause the video and get there. We are annotating using the notes. The note bar is here. The underline is here. The highlights are here. Use those to make your annotations. Just to review where we are so far, the scene that just took place is Roger was throwing stones at Henry in the lake, intentionally missing him. And the idea was for you to notice the change in rules. How is the perspective of rules changing now that there is no one in authority, no adults? They're up to their own discretion now. So how is the nature of man playing into this? And here we go with the next section. This is now dealing with the mask. We are in a pandemic. So compare the mask and the story to what we are dealing with in our current society. Then Henry lost interest in stones and wandered off. Roger. Jack was standing under a tree about 10 yards away. When Roger opened his eyes and saw him, a darker shadow crept beneath the swarthiness of his skin, but Jack noticed nothing. He was eager and patient, beckoning, so that Roger went to him. There was a small pool at the end of the river, dammed back by sand and full of white water lilies and needle-like reeds. Here, Sam and Eric were waiting, and Bill. Jack, concealed from the sun, knelt by the pool and opened the two large leaves that he carried. One of them contained white clay and the other red. By them lay a stick of charcoal brought down from the fire. Jack explained to Roger as he worked. They don't smell me. They see me, I think. Something pink under the trees. He smeared on the clay. If only I had some green. He turned a half-concealed face up to Roger and answered to the incomprehension of his gaze. For hunting, like in the war, you know, dazzle paint. Like things trying to look like something else. He twisted in the urgency of telling. Like moths on a tree trunk. Roger understood and nodded gravely. The twins moved toward Jack and began to protest timidly about something. Jack waved them away. Shut up. He rubbed the charcoal stick between the patches of red and white on his face. No, you two, come with me. He peered at his reflection and disliked it. He bent down, took up a double handful of lukewarm water and rubbed the mess from his face. Freckles and sandy eyebrows appeared. Roger smiled unwillingly. You don't half look a mess. Jack planned his new face. He made one cheek and one eye socket white. Then he rubbed red over the other half of his face and slashed a black bar of charcoal across from right ear to left jaw. He looked in the pool for his reflection, but his breathing troubled the mirror. Sam and Eric, get me a coconut, an empty one. He knelt, holding the shell of water. A rounded patch of sunlight fell on his face and a brightness appeared in the depths of the water. He looked in astonishment, no longer at himself, but at an awesome stranger. He split the water and leapt to his feet, laughing excitedly. Beside the pool, his sinewy body held up a mask that drew their eyes and appalled them. He began to dance, and his laughter became a bloodthirsty snarling. He capered toward Bill, and the mask was a thing on its own, behind which Jack hid, liberated from shame and self-consciousness. The face of red and white and black swung through the air and jigged toward Bill. Bill started up laughing. Then suddenly he fell silent and blundered away through the bushes. Jack rushed toward the twins. The rest... So what's happening in this scene right here, what is being described as the qualities of the mask? How is Jack feeling? These are what you should be annotating and thinking about. To making a line, come on, but we, come on, I'll creep up and stab. The mask compelled them. Ralph climbed out of the bathing pool and trotted up the beach and sat in the shade beneath the palms. His fair hair was plastered over his eyebrows and he pushed it back. Simon was floating in the water and kicking with his feet, and Maurice was practicing diving. Piggy was mooning about, aimlessly picking up things and discarding them. The rock pools, which so fascinated him, were covered by the tide, so he was without an interest until the tide went back. Presently, seeing Ralph under the palms, he came and sat by him. Piggy wore the remainders of a pair of shorts. His fat body was golden brown, 
and the glasses still flashed when he looked at anything. He was the only boy on the island whose hair never seemed to grow. The rest were shock-headed, but Piggy's hair still lay in wisps over his head as though baldness were his natural state, and this imperfect covering would soon go like the velvet on a young stag's antlers. I've been thinking, he said, about a clock. We could make a sundial. We could put a stick in the sand and then... The effort to express the mathematical processes involved was too great. He made a few passes instead. And it... Okay, so here's, here's a reference to Piggy, again, being the intelligent one, giving directions. He's giving leadership. What, who is behind the scenes giving the instructions to the leader based on their charismatic nature? But is it someone behind with intelligence giving them directions? Here's an example of how Piggy is doing that. Airplane and a TV set, said Ralph sourly, and a steam engine. Piggy shook his head. You have to have a lot of metal things for that, he said. And we haven't got no metal, but we got a stick. Ralph turned and smiled involuntarily. Piggy was a bore. His fat, his asthmar, and his matter-of-fact ideas were dull. But there was always a little pleasure to be got out of pulling his leg, even if one did it by accident. Piggy saw the smile and misinterpreted it as friendliness. There had grown up tacitly among the biggins the opinion that Piggy was an outsider, not only by accent, which did not matter, but by fat and asthmar and specks and a certain disinclination for manual labor. Now, finding that something he had said made Ralph smile, he rejoiced and pressed his advantage. We got a lot of sticks. We could have a sundial each. Then we should know what the time was. A fat lot of good that would be. You said you wanted things done, so as we could be rescued. Oh, shut up. He leapt to his feet and trotted back to the pool, just as Maurice did a rather poor dive. Ralph was glad of a chance to change the subject. He shouted as Maurice came to the surface. Belly flop! Belly flop! Maurice flashed a smile at Ralph, who slid easily into the water. Of all the boys, he was the most at home there. But today, irked by the mention of rescue, the useless footling mention of rescue, even the green depths of water and the shattered golden sun held no balm. Instead of remaining and playing, he swam with steady strokes under Simon and crawled out of the other side of the pool to lie there, sleek and streaming like a seal. Piggy, always clumsy, stood up and came to stand by him, so that Ralph rolled on his stomach and pretended not to see. The mirages had died away, and gloomily he ran his eye along the top blue line of the horizon. The next moment he was on his feet and shouting, Smoke! Smoke! Simon tried to sit up in the water and got a mouthful. Maurice, who had been standing ready to dive, swayed back on his heels, made a bolt for the platform, then swerved back to the grass under the palms. There he started to pull on his tattered shorts to be ready for anything. Ralph stood, one hand holding back his hair, the other clenched. Simon was climbing out of the water. Piggy was rubbing his glasses on his shorts and squinting at the sea. Maurice had got both legs through one leg of his shorts. Of all the boys, only Ralph was still. I can't see no smoke, said Piggy incredulously. I can't see no smoke, Ralph. Where is it? Ralph said nothing. Now both his hands were clenched over his forehead so that the fair hair was kept out of his eyes. He was leaning forward and already the salt was whitening his body. Ralph, where's the ship? Simon stood by, looking from Ralph to the horizon. Maurice's trousers gave way with a sigh, and he abandoned them as a wreck, rushed toward the forest, and then came back again. The smoke was a tight little knot on the horizon and was uncoiling slowly. Beneath the smoke was a dot that might be a funnel. Ralph's face was pale as he spoke to himself. They'll see our smoke. Piggy was looking in the right direction now. It don't look much. He turned around and peered up at the mountain. Ralph continued to watch the ship ravenously. Color was coming back into his face. Simon stood by him, silent. I know I can't see very much, said Piggy, but have we got any smoke? Ralph moved impatiently, still watching the ship. There's smoke on the mountain. Maurice came running and stared out to sea. Both Simon and Piggy were looking up at the mountain. Piggy screwed up his face, but Simon cried out as though he had hurt himself. Ralph! Ralph! The quality of his speech twisted Ralph on the sand. You tell me, said Piggy anxiously. Is there a signal? Ralph looked back at the dispersing smoke in the horizon, then up at the mountain. 
Ralph, please, is there a signal? Simon put out his hand timidly to touch Ralph, but Ralph started to run, splashing through the shallow end of the bathing pool, across the hot white sand and under the palms. A moment later, he was battling with the complex undergrowth that was already engulfing the scar. Simon ran after him, then Maurice. Biggie shouted, Ralph, please, Ralph. Then he too started to run, stumbling over Maurice's discarded shorts before he was across the terrace. Behind the four boys, the smoke moved gently along the horizon, and on the beach, Henry and Johnny were throwing sand at Percival, who was crying quietly again, and all three were in complete ignorance of the excitement. By the time Ralph had reached the landward end of the scar, he was using precious breath to swear. He did desperate violence to his naked body among the rasping creepers so that blood was sliding over him. Just where the steep ascent of the mountain began, he stopped. Maurice was only a few yards behind him. Piggy Specks, shouted Ralph. If the fire's all out, we'll need them. He stopped shouting and swayed on his feet. Piggy was only just visible, bumbling up from the beach. Ralph looked at the horizon, then up to the mountain. Was it better to fetch Piggy's glasses, or would the ship have gone? Or, if they climbed on, supposing the fire was all out, and they had to watch Piggy crawling nearer and the ship sinking under the horizon. Balanced on a high peak of need, agonized by indecision, Ralph cried out. Oh, God! Oh, God! Simon, struggling with the bushes, caught his breath. His face was twisted. Ralph blundered on, savaging himself, as the wisp of smoke moved on. The fire was dead. They saw that straight away saw what they had really known down on the beach when the smoke of home had beckoned. The fire was out, smokeless and dead. The watchers were gone. A pile of unused fuel lay ready. Ralph turned to the sea. The horizon stretched, impersonal once more, barren of all but the faintest trace of smoke. Ralph ran stumbling along the rocks, saved himself on the edge of the pink cliff, and screamed at the ship. Come back! Come back! He ran backwards and forwards along the cliff, his face always to the sea, and his voice rose insanely. Come back! Come back! Simon and Maurice arrived. Ralph looked at them with unwinking eyes. Simon turned away, smearing the water from his cheeks. Ralph reached inside himself for the worst word he knew. They let the bloody fire go out. He okay, so we're going to stop there for today. Hope you enjoyed the reading. Read on your own, continue reading, make your annotations, and I'll see you guys on the next go round. Answer those questions completely. Have a great day, guys.